and welcome to part one of our lecture on labor demand. We're going to switch over now and look at the demand side of the market. And who is the participant in the demand side of the market? Well, it's the firms, of course. The demand for labor, though, is a derived demand. So it's referred to as derived demand because the inputs used for production are not used for consumption. They're used as inputs into the production of final goods and services. So firms hire workers because their consumers want to purchase the goods and services. And so the demand for workers is actually derived from the wants and desires of the consumer. So the demand for a factor is necessarily linked to the demand for goods and services that the factor is used to produce. So the theory of labor demand examines the quantity of labor services the firm desires to employ given the market determined wage, that's what we'll be looking at in this lecture, or alternatively the labor supply function the firm faces. A lecture we're going to look at today, the firms are just going to face a constant wage. So we're assuming that the labor market is competitive. But in certain market structures, uh, the firm will actually face the labor supply function. And so it will actually need to increase the wage if it wants to hire more workers. And we'll discuss that in a future lecture. The central questions we're looking at in this lecture are how many workers should a firm hire and what are they going to be paid? Okay, so there's two time horizons that we need to consider when we're thinking about the demand for labor. The first is the short run, and we know what the short run is. We've seen this before. You've seen it in, in your microeconomics lect lectures. It's simply uh, a time period in which one or more of the factors of production cannot be varied. Okay, so one of the inputs to production is fixed. The context we typically think about is where capital is fixed. For example, a pizzeria. In the short run, it, the size of its building or its kitchen, the number of ovens it uses is fixed. It can vary its labor in the short run, but in the short run it cannot vary its capital. But over time, so in the long run, we are thinking of a time period where all factors of production are variable. So in terms of a pizzeria, any pizzeria in the long run can alter their the size of their kitchen, the number of ovens they're using, etc. So the short run is when one input is fixed. We typically think of capital as being fixed. And in the long run, there are no fixed inputs to production. All of them we think of as being variable. Today, we're just going to look at the short run and look at the short run demand for labor. Okay, so the demand for labor depends on the firm's object objectives and constraints, of course. So their simple objective is to maximize profit and they face a number of constraints. One is the market structure that, that they're in. Two, the demand for the product. Okay, so the consumer demand for the product. So factor prices are also important. The production function, which gives the maximum output given the various combinations of inputs. So the firm is objective is to maximize profits and it has a, a number of constraints. Um, of course, the decision-making frame, short run versus long run, is key. And again, in this lecture, we're just going to look at the short run. In the next lecture, we're going to look at the long run. Um, so market structures. So let's talk a little bit about what, we're what we mean by market structures. We know what market structures are, but in the context of the labor market, uh, what are the different market structures? So we know the market structures in the product market, we've seen these before. We have, of course, perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and monopoly. And these are listed in de decreasing degree of competition. Of course, in a monopoly, there is no competition at all. There's only one firm. Now, in the labor market, we can have similar market structures, although they're going to have slightly different names at times. In the case of perfect competition, we would have many, many, many people supplying 
their labor, and we would think of each particular firm facing a fixed wage. We have monopsonistic competition, and so that's the analog of monopolistic competition. And so the individuals in the labor market could vary their services to a bit of an extent. Uh, again, we'll look at that uh, shortly. Also, you can have an oligopsony and a monopsony. Okay, so these are the analogs of the product market. And again, these are listed in the decreasing degree of competition. Okay, the categories are actually independent of each other. So when we're looking at the context of uh, profit maximization of the firm, we could actually have quite a few different combinations. We could have a product market that's perfectly competitive, but a labor market that's a monopsony. And you can see there's four in each, so there would be a total of 16 different combinations. We're only gonna consider you know, the, the key uh, combinations. We're not gonna look at all of them. Uh, we're going to start with just assuming that the product market is perfectly competitive. So the product price is given. So the firms take that as given because they're just a very small player in the market. And the same with the labor market. We're going to assume that that's perfectly competitive. And so the firm has no influence over the wage. Uh, they take the wage rate as given. So the production function is just a function that determines how much output is going to be produced given a certain amount of capital and labor. So it describes the technology essentially that the firm uses to produce goods and services. So the, the firm's production processes and management decision and all that is captured by this function. The marginal product of labor is the change in output resulting from hiring an additional worker holding constant the quantity of other inputs. So in this case it would be the derivative of the production function with respect to L holding capital constant. The marginal product of capital would be is similarly defined. It would be the derivative of the production function with respect to capital but holding labor constant. Okay, so when we're thinking of the marginal product of labor, we're thinking about how much extra output do we get from hiring an additional uh, unit of labor. And for the marginal product of capital, this would be the additional output we get from increasing the amount of capital uh, by one unit, holding labor constant. Okay? So we're going to assume perfect competition for now. We're going, and we're in the short run, right? So we're going to assume that capital is fixed. We're assuming that we just have two uh, factors of production to keep the uh, exposition simple. So we have labor and capital. These are used to produce output. And we're again going to assume that capital is fixed. So we're just gonna put a bar over top of K to um, let us know that it is fixed. Let's look at an example now, some data. So here in the first column, we have the units of labor. In the second column, we have total product Q. So if we don't have any labor, we're not gonna be able to make anything. If we hire one person, we're gonna be able to produce four units of output. If we hire the second person, our total output would be 16 and so on. Now let's calculate the marginal product of labor. Well, the marginal product of labor is just the change in Q divided by the change in L. And here the change in L is always one, so that makes our calculation very easy. So the marginal product of labor here is going to be four. So when we hire the first person, that additional amount of output that we get is four. When we hire the second person, we get a marginal product of labor of 12. So we're getting 12 more by hiring that second person. And so in this case, we have that, you know, there must be some synergies going on here. When we only have one person, they can produce four. Um, but if we have two people, it's not as if the quantity just increased to eight, it actually increased much more. Okay, so we're getting more output per worker as we add workers up to, up to this point. 
when we hire the third unit of labor, we have 36. So it jumps all the way to 36. And so just hiring this third worker, we get a boost of 20 units of output, okay? Now, when we go to the fourth unit of labor, we get 60, and again, the marginal product of labor is increasing. But this isn't gonna happen forever in most production processes since we have one of the inputs fixed, in this case, capital. Um, if you keep adding workers, at some point, um, the synergies that you're getting uh, are not going to be uh, you know, there anymore. Um, and your marginal product of labor is going to start to fall. So at first when you add labor to a production process, you're going to benefit and get larger increases in marginal product because of, say, specialization. If you were to think about a restaurant, um, if you have one person cooking and serving the tables, they're not going to be able to do much, serve you know that many dinners because they're doing everything themselves. But if you hire a second person and have them specialize, so one cooking the food and one serving the food in the dining room, you're gonna be able to produce a lot more in a certain period of time because each person is specializing. And as you add more workers, you can specialize. Maybe some can just make drinks, etc. But at some point you're, you know, you have everyone specializing and then you're you're gonna be adding workers. Say you're gonna be adding workers to the kitchen and dining room. Um, that boost in production at some point will start to fall. Okay, and we call that diminishing uh, returns to labor. And we see that that starts to happen when we hire the fifth worker. So when we hire the fifth worker, we're getting more output. We're getting 15 extra, but we're not getting as much as when we hired the person before. Okay, so now the marginal product of labor is falling. And at some point it can even be negative. And you can think of if you're um, hiring too much labor in our restaurant example, if you have too many people working, they could be getting in each other's way and it actually could be overall uh, a detriment to the production process. So it's important to notice this isn't when diminishing marginal product kicks in, it's when the marginal product starts to decrease, not when it becomes negative. So make sure you don't make that mistake. The last column here, we have the average product. So this is on average, how much does every worker produce? We know from this column exactly what each unit is responsible for uh, their, you know, their additional uh, contribution to overall production. We know that here. For example, from you know the second person, when we go from one to two, that person makes 16 extra units. But we we want a measure of just on average what's the average product per worker. So in this case, we're just going to look at the total quantity and then divide it by the number of workers. That's what average product is. It's the total output divided by how many units of that input were used to make it. So it's on average. We know in this example that the first person makes four, second person uh, increases total output by 16, but on average, each produce eight. And that's just from taking 16, dividing it by two. So the average product, uh, when we have three units of labor, uh, is 36 divided by 3, which is equal to 12, and so on. So when the marginal product is above the average product, it's going to increase it, and then uh, when it becomes below, it will pull the average down. Let's look at these in a diagram. So in the top panel, this is total product. Okay, so this is just you know, plotted against number of workers. So if we have one unit of labor, we get an output of four. If we have two workers, we get an output of 18, and so on. As I said, there's this thing called the law of diminishing returns. So where does that set in? Well, we said it sets in at the fourth worker. Now, what's interesting about this point that we see here, does anyone know the mathematical name for it? Well, in this portion, the amount total product or Q is increasing at an increasing rate. But after this point, it's increasing, but at a decreasing rate. This is called an inflection point. And the inflection point is where the diminishing returns begins to occur in this example. Okay? And then here we see that uh, production actually starts to fall. So this is the point of diminishing returns. It's the inflection point. 
and this is the point of maximum uh, total product. Now let's look at the marginal. So below we're looking at marginal product and so this is simply the the derivative of this function with respect to L. Okay so you can think of this showing the slope of lines tangent uh, to this curve and of course at this inflection point that's where the marginal product is the highest. So when we higher up to four units we're always getting more and more output so it's increasing at an increasing rate then all of a sudden the marginal product is falling so we're still getting more and more output but it's increasing at a decreasing rate okay so this inflection point corresponds to the top of the marginal product of labor and this is the point of diminishing returns and then at some point marginal product can even be negative so here if we hire the eighth worker uh, he or she might just be getting in the way of the other employees and so is actually making things worse and so production would actually be less by hiring this person and so the marginal product is negative negative. and the point of maximum productivity is the top of the AP curve remember average uh, this is average product so this is just um, how much each worker produces on average okay and so this is the most productive point here and so that means we're getting the most output on average per worker and so clearly here we see that average product will rise when the marginal product is increasing right so if this is the average and what we're adding to the average is an increasing number we're gonna have that the average is increasing here it's falling and so the average product is going to begin to fall and at some point they're going to become equal okay if this is above this this is falling this is taking the average so at some point it's going to uh, lead you to have the exact same number for both and then this keeps falling and so the average product curve keeps falling as well okay so we know that the objective of the firm is to maximize profits okay the profit function is simply price times quantity okay so the price of the good times the quantity so that's total sales and then we subtract from that our costs and so we're assuming we just have capital and labor and so here the cost is the wage times how many people we employ and sometimes we use L sometimes we use E um, in this case you know think of this as an L it's the same thing and then we also have the cost of capital which is the rental rate of capital times the amount of capital used and again this is going to be fixed in this lecture so again P times Q is total revenue this these two last terms are the total costs because that's what we're gonna what we're gonna be spending on our our variable inputs and so uh, the overall profit is this so perfectly competitive firms cannot influence prices of output or inputs so we're gonna be taking both the wage and the price of capital uh, as fixed and the amount of capital is as fixed as well okay in economics we think on the margin so um, in a nutshell you should keep doing something as long as the marginal benefit of doing it exceeds the marginal cost right in this case we're thinking of producing so we should keep producing a firm should keep producing as long as the marginal benefit of that exceeds the marginal cost so in this context what's the marginal benefit well the marginal benefit is the addition in additional revenue you get from hiring the extra person so it's the increase in your revenue as a you know it's what's your change in total revenue over the change in L and we can calculate this uh, we'll see in a second by just taking the marginal product of labor and multiplying it by the price in this example because price is fixed we can just multiply it by marginal product of labor and so that's the additional benefit if you hire someone they're going to produce some output that output has some value measured by the price you multiply them that's the value so we should keep hiring as long as the marginal uh, revenue product 
or the marginal benefit from hiring an additional worker exceeds the marginal cost. And so what's the marginal cost in this context? Well, it's the wage. And so we should keep hiring people as long as their benefit is higher than what we're paying them. That's all this is saying. Okay, so um, this is answering what I was just mentioning. So what's the marginal benefit of an additional worker to increase output? Well, we actually have two measures we're going to talk about. In, in, the, in the context of perfect competition here, they actually are, are the same thing. But in some cases, they won't be the same thing. So we should at least define them now. And the textbook um, sometimes uses a bit different notation or a different value than I'm using in here. Um, but for this lecture, um, these two uh, terms I'm going to explain to you in a moment are the same. So the first is the value of marginal product of labor. Okay, This is simply the marginal product times the dollar value of the output. So it's just the marginal product of labor times the price. Okay, and we call that the value of marginal product. Okay, so this again indicates the dollar benefit derived from hiring an additional worker holding capital constant. So, and, and in the short run we're, we are holding capital constant. So in this case, it's the marginal benefit of hiring additional workers. So that's equal to the VMPE. Marginal revenue product of labor, and this is what I mentioned in just previously, it's the more general term. Usually this is used a lot more. Um, it's the marginal product of labor times the marginal revenue of output. Okay, so that's the only difference. It's, mar it's multiplied by the marginal revenue of output. But we know in perfect competition, the price and the marginal revenue are the same. So this P is equal to this. And so here, the value of marginal product is equal to the marginal revenue product. So in this case, the bo both of them are the same thing. So we can use them interchangeably uh, in this lecture. Um, so we'll, we'll use the marginal revenue product of labor in the following discussion. So sometimes I'll switch back and forth, but uh, it, they're, they're the same thing in this lecture. So make sure you, uh, are aware of that. Now, um, later on, uh, if you think of a monopolist, well, their marginal revenue is not equal to the price. Okay, so you can see that in some cases uh, this would not hold, and so, you know, in that case, we're going to be using the marginal revenue product of labor, and we're not going to call it the value of marginal product. Now, what's the marginal cost of hiring an additional worker to increase output? Well, I already said that. It's obviously the wage, okay? So it's held in this assumption of a perfectly competitive market, it's constant. And we will see later uh, when this, you know, we'll, we'll relax this assumption and assume that the firm faces an upward sloping labor supply curve and the analysis will be much different. But for now, marginal cost of labor is equal to the wage and firms want to maximize profit. Um, and we're gonna see so the marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So that's the optimal condition. And again, it's simple to remember that because in economics, we think on the margin, you're going to um, keep doing something as long as the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. And we saw earlier that this is equivalent to saying the marginal revenue product of labor equals the W. And only in this case, we could also say here the value of marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. Okay, so how does a firm maximize profit? So I'm going to go over a little more detail now of how we get at that profit maximizing condition. So again, uh, we think on the margin. And so the marginal benefit should exceed marginal cost. So in this case, in the context of a firm producing, the firm should produce or expand output if the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. Okay, so in this case, the marginal benefit is the marginal revenue uh, from one increase in the unit of labor. So it's the marginal revenue product. Okay, the marginal cost is the wage. If this is true, we should increase production. 
if the and again so this is just you know rewriting this as a marginal revenue product there's an n here but it it equals a uh, number of workers or labor so this is the same thing as an l okay so again overall we should keep hiring if the marginal revenue product exceeds the wage okay and just to reinforce it you keep expanding until the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost or in other words the marginal revenue product of labor equals the wage okay so we know that uh, a firm in a competitive market is a price taker um, they could hire as much labor as they want without affecting the market wage. Uh, the marginal and average cost is the market wage. And they're going to hire until marginal revenue product of L equals the wage. And so we're going to see then that the short run labor demand curve is actually the marginal revenue product curve. Now to understand that it's very simple. What is a, uh, in a, in a typical demand curve, what, what variables are we looking at? Well, we have the price on the horizontal, or on the vertical axis, and the quantity on the uh, horizontal axis. And so, in a labor market, we have wage on the vertical axis, and on the horizontal axis, we have uh, the number of units of labor hired. Okay, and so the labor demand curve is the relationship between the wage and how many units of labor uh, is going to be hired. Okay, well, the optimum condition sets wage equal to the marginal revenue product of labor. So if we know the wage in the market, then we set that equal to the marginal revenue product of labor and figure out what quantity is associated with that. And so that is information about demand. So. The marginal revenue product curve is actually uh, the labor demand curve. Let's look at a diagram to make that a little more clear. So, <clears throat> and then we'll actually work out the mathematics. So, in general, profit is revenue minus cost. Okay, we know that here revenue is price times Q. We know Q is a function of labor and capital. Here, capital is fixed. And then we know our costs relate to our labor and capital, how much we use times their prices. So minus the wage times labor, minus the rental rate of capital times the amount of capital used, which again is fixed. So if we take the derivative of this with respect to L, then we're going to get this term, so pi prime, so that's representing the derivative of this with respect to L is equal to P times Q prime L. So this here is just this, the derivative of this with respect to L. Okay, and what is that? That's actually the marginal product of labor. Okay, and then we take, uh, we subtract away the derivative of this with respect to L, which is just W. There's no L's here, so the derivative uh, here is equal to zero. Okay, so we've taken the derivative of this and we want to set that equal to zero to find the maximum amount that we should hire. So again, this is the marginal product of labor. When we multiply it by P, it's the marginal revenue product of labor. Okay, we're setting that equal to zero and of course we bring down the wage and we can rearrange this uh, to get this condition here so remember this marginal revenue product of labor is just P times MPL so here I'm just writing that fact again the marginal product of labor times the price which is this thing has to equal the marginal revenue product of labor these are the same thing and which we also know is the same thing as the value of the marginal product of labor here it's the same and the optimum condition states that you know these things must equal the wage if we look here we move this on the other side 
of the equal sign, cancel the negatives, and we get that the marginal revenue product of labor has to equal the wage. And then we can just rewrite the marginal revenue product of labor as value of marginal product of labor. Uh, that's what the textbook does in this chapter. They, they use this variable, so we'll use that here. So that's the profit maximizing condition. So the labor demand curve then is just derived from varying the wage and plotting the associated um, levels of L that maximize profit, right? If the market wage is W1, the firm will take that as given, set that equal to its value of marginal product of labor, and this will be a function and, and you'd be able to figure out what the uh, L is that you should use, the maximum number of workers. Okay, and that is this L right here. So if the wage in the market is W1, the firm will want to hire this much labor. If the wage is W0, the firm will want to hire this much labor. And if the wage is $2, or sorry, if this is the wage here, W2, they'll want to hire L2 units of labor. And so we trace that out. And here we're saying that there is a negative slope so that it's downward sloping. And that's actually a consequence of diminishing returns. So the higher the wage, the less we would want to hire. Okay, so at each of these points, a maximum condition that's being solved by the firm to figure out, given the wage, what the amount of labor is. Okay, so in this diagram, we have our value of marginal product of labor and the value of average product. Okay, and these mirror the images of the marginal product of labor and the uh, average product. The only thing here is things are multiplied by the price. Okay, so they're very similar. The uh, value of marginal product of labor is going to hit the value of the average product of labor at its maximum. And so Let's think about what a firm would do if the wage was W0. So in this case, a firm, the wage was W0, they would hire L star zero units of labor. If the wage was W1, we go over, see where that equals the value of marginal product of labor, it equals it here, and so they would hire L star one units of labor. But what about if the wage is higher than W1. Are we still going to set that equal to the value of the marginal product of labor and look down and see how much the firm would hire? Well, the answer is no. Okay, so for example, at a wage of W2, we're going to say that the firm is going to shut down. The reason why is simple to see. We know that a firm must cover its variable costs. Um, its fixed costs are sunk costs, so they have to pay them anyways. But the variable costs are not sunk costs. And so if the firm is not able to cover their variable costs, then they should shut down because they'll at least minimize their losses. So um, if we look, in order to be able to cover your variable costs, the price times the quantity must exceed the variable cost, which is wage times labor. If we divide both of these by L, we'll see that that's equivalent to saying that the value of the average product of labor must be greater than or equal to the wage. Okay, so at W2, we see that that's not true. Um, so let's look at W0. So at W0, the firm would hire L star zero units of labor. And so the wage is W0, and at this level of labor, the value of average product would be here, and it would be higher than W0. Okay, so here the firm's not gonna shut down. The value of average product of labor is greater than W0. But for uh, this point here, so if the wage is W2, we set that equal to our value of marginal product of labor, we would get this amount of labor, but at this amount of labor, the uh, value of the average product of labor is less than 
W-2. So this wouldn't make sense. The firm would minimize its losses by shutting down. And so the actual demand for labor is the value of the marginal product of labor or the marginal revenue product of labor um, for when the value of average product of labor uh, exceeds the value of the marginal product of labor. So it would be this curve right here that's um, this thick uh, curve here. That's what we would be looking at. Um, so the value of marginal product of labor or the marginal revenue product of labor is the demand for labor curve but only for certain for a certain range which is indicated here okay so the only points on the var value of marginal product curve or value of marginal product of labor curve that are relevant for the firm's hiring decisions are the ones that lie on the downward sloping portion um, of the curve below the point where the value of average product of labor curve intersects the value of the marginal product of labor curve. So this intersection point. Okay, so just a brief summary. The short run labor demand curve is the same as the marginal revenue uh, product um, of labor curve, which is also the VMP here. Um, but the point at which the curves intersect, so it's not the entire marginal revenue product of labor curve, but only uh, the downward portion of it where the curves intersect. And note that the firm will shut down if the wage is greater than the maximum of the value of average product. Okay, so let's do some practice questions. So here we have uh, a firm. The output at this firm depends on the number of supervisors hired. Okay, so here we have listed below uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five supervisors. And for each, we have the output. So the factory sells its output for 50 cents each. So P is equal to 50 cents. It hires 50 production workers at a wage of $100 per day and needs to decide how many supervisors to hire. The daily wage of supervisors is $500 but output rises more, you know, output rises as more and more supervisors are hired, as shown below. So the question is, how many supervisors should it hire? Okay, well, what we need to do is first calculate the marginal product of labor, then we need to calculate the value of the marginal product of labor, and then we need to compare that with the wage. So let's first look at how we get the marginal product of labor, well, that's simple. It's the change in Q over the change in L. So we're just gonna take the differences of these and they're going to be here. And since the change in L, here the change in the number of supervisors is always one, it's just the difference in these two numbers. Now that might not all, in every example that might, you know, in different examples that could be different. So you always wanna pay attention to make sure you're dividing by the right thing. Now. Uh, the value of the marginal product of labor is very easy to calculate because we just multiply each of these by the price, which is 50 cents. And so we get 1900, 1600, 750, 350, and 200. Now the wage is $500. We take that as given, okay? And so now what's the maximum number of supervisors to hire? So if we hire one supervisor, the marginal product of labor is three. 1800 the value of that is 1900 and we have to pay the person $500 so should we pay $500 to get $1900 yes let's keep going we hire the second supervisor we're gonna get 1600 and we're only gonna have to pay that person 500 yes keep going uh, we get to three supervisors the value we're gonna get is 350 and we're gonna ha we're gonna have to pay 500. Should we do that? Yes. If we hire the fourth supervisor, the value will be 350. Should we pay 500 to get 350? No, that doesn't make sense. So we would hire up to three supervisors. And so we're going to you know again 
we're using our profit maximizing condition. We're trying to get where the value of marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. Well, here it's, you know, we don't have a continuous example where we can have, you know, 1.5 supervisors or 3.5. Um, and so here, the closest we get to the condition is to hire three supervisors. Okay, so the firm would hire three supervisors. If it hires four, it will lose money. So we're not going to do that. Um, if we were looking at um, some other type of input, maybe that was more was continuously defined, um, we would get exactly maybe something like 3.4 um, inputs should be used. But here we're talking about supervisors. We can't divide them in half. And so we're stopping at three. Um, we're not going to go to four because we know we'll uh, lose money. So the answer is three. Okay, next question. Suppose the hourly wage is $10 and the price of each unit of capital is $25. The price of output is constant at $50 per unit and we're given the following production function. Q is equal to E to the one half, K to the one half. Suppose the current capital stock is fixed at 1,600 units. Okay, so remember that K is equal to 1,600. It's asking us to find the marginal product of labor. Then it's asking us how much should the firm hire in the short run, and then what its profit will be. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is take the derivative of the production function with respect to E. Here E is the amount of labor. And so when we do that, we get that it's equal to one half times K divided by E to the one half. And remember when you take the derivative you're putting this into the front and subtracting one from the exponent and then here we're just simplifying. Okay so we have our marginal product of labor. It's equal to this. Okay so now we need to figure out how many units of labor the firm should hire. Okay so um, we know uh, we need to set the value of marginal product of labor equal to the wage. So first let's figure out what the value of marginal product of labor is. Okay, so we know we're going to take the marginal product of labor and multiply that by marginal revenue, or actually it's going to be equal, multiplied by the price here. Okay, um, it's the value of marginal product of labor because this is equal to P. And so that equals this expression here. How did we get that? Well, we plugged in the K equals 1600 into our marginal product of labor function. Okay, we plug that in and this is what we get. We simplify it. We get 1000 divided by E to the one half. Now, how do we solve for the optimum number of workers? Well, we're going to set this equal to the wage. Okay, and when we do that, we end up getting 10,000 workers. So I've worked it out here below for you. So the wage is $10. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the value of marginal product of labor, which is the 1,000 divided by E to the uh, 1 half, and set that equal to uh, the wage. Okay, and that's what we do here. And then when we work it out, we get that E is equal to 10,000. Now profit, well we know the profit to the firm is equal to its total revenue which is price which is $50 times Q so this is the production function and we're gonna plug in our number of workers which is 10,000 and our fixed capital at 1600. Okay so that'll give us our total revenue and then we subtract from that total cost. So the wage is $10, we're going to hire 10,000 workers, so that's the cost of workers, and minus the price of capital times how much capital we're going to use. Okay, and so profit then is going to be equal to $60,000 when we work out the math. Okay, now last question. So here we're given some figures uh, in this table. First column is the number of workers. The second column is output, and then it's asking us to fill in the marginal product of labor and then the value of the marginal product of labor. 
Okay, so we're told that the price is $5. Okay, so what is the marginal product of labor? Well, we know that it's just the contribution of the first worker, uh, and so that's equal to 1,000. Again, it's the change in Q over the change in L. Second worker, change in Q over change in workers is equal to one, so it's 800. Okay, the difference here is 600, etc. So we always have diminishing uh, marginal uh, util or, uh, di uh, diminishing marginal returns here. Now the value of marginal product of labor, how do we get that? All we do is multiply this by five. Okay, so that's easy. Um, now it wants us to graph this. It wants us to graph the value of the marginal product of labor. Okay, so <clears throat> if we do that, we'll get this. So if the wage is 5,000, they'll hire one worker, etc. Okay, so that's the value of the marginal product of labor curve, and so that's also the uh, demand for labor curve. Now, what happens if the wage was $2,500 per week? How much would this firm want to hire? Well, if the wage is $2,500, we're going to set that equal to the value of the marginal product of labor, and it's going to be equal here at 3.5 workers. Well, we're not going to hire 3.5 workers. We're going to hire three workers. Okay, so the answer is equal to three. Again, uh, any amount smaller than three would not be smart. So hiring two workers would not be smart because you can hire additional worker and get more in terms of revenue than you would pay out in terms of a wage. If you were going to hire four workers, that wouldn't make sense because you would be uh, paying more for the worker than what that worker is going to contribute to revenue. Okay, so three is the best number of workers. It's the one that optimizes the firm's profits. Next class, we will be looking at the demand for labor part two. And in this lecture, we will look at the long run demand for labor curve. And in this setup, we're gonna have that both capital and labor are allowed to vary. So thank you again, and we'll see you next time.